Hi there, welcome to Sure Foundation Lutheran Church's podcast channel. The following sermon was preached on January 8th, 2023, on the basis of Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The the, the sermon and our gospel lesson today will be based on on Matthew chapter 2, the first 12 verses here. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi came uh, to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw the star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard that heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the gospel of the Lord. If you uh, traveled over Christmas vacation um, and, and you traveled by airplane... Maybe you're wishing you hadn't. Maybe you're one of the few people that, that actually had smooth flights, but for a lot of Americans, it was a major frustration. Massive delays, altogether canceled flights, and then everybody's luggage was heading in, in every which direction to places where they, they weren't. This is a, a picture of the Baltimore airport, if you saw that one going around Everybody's baggage just just sitting there because it went to their destination and they're in a different place. Just an absolute mess. We went to uh, Nashville to visit uh, Chrissy's family. We all kind of met in Nashville there right after after Christmas, and we we drove so we didn't have any any frustrations on on flying like that. But but Chrissy's sister and 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 her fiance they flew and they happened to be flying Southwest, which was the one that was really bad. Uh, they flew southwest down, and, and they physically made it to Nashville. That was great. But their bags were going to Atlanta. And, and so they had resigned themselves to the, the fact that either it was going to take a long time for them to get their bags, or uh, they would have to drive down to Atlanta to, to get their bags. That is until the next day. The next day, uh, her, her fiancé's mom happened to be watching the, the, the news, the national news, where the reporter happened to be in the the airport in Nashville. And what did she see in the background but these bright orange bags that she recognized? And so she quick snapped a picture and sent it to her son. And sure enough, that was their bags. They they hadn't made it to Atlanta. They had stayed there in in Nashville. What are the chances, right, That, that first of all, that the bags stayed in Nashville that his mom happened to be watching the national news at just the right time, that the news person happened to be in Nashville, and that the camera angle was just right so that they could see the the bright orange bags in the background. It it seemed like a lot of things had to go just right for that to happen, right? Now, uh, the return of lost luggage is a rather small thing in in the grand scheme of things, right? But I'm sure... You could think of, and it wouldn't take you too much effort to think of times in your life or in the lives of the people around you when things had to go just right to work out well, 
things had to go just right to keep you safe. We see that a lot of times in, in Scripture, too. And really, that's no surprise to us as we're reading Scripture because God's sovereign. He's over all things. He, he has his hand in all things, and he's governing all things for his good purposes. So it's not a surprise when things go just right to work out in the way that, that God intends them to work out. And, and the story of the Magi is actually one of those cases this morning, too, where things went just right and brought the Magi to, to see this, this Savior, this King. Now, you've maybe heard this story quite a bit, right? Uh, wise men from the east, Magi from the east, they, they travel a great distance to come and see Jesus, to come worship this Christ child, to come worship God in the flesh. Yet, as many times as you've heard it, have you ever considered this? How many people at that time had heard this story? Before Matthew recorded it, before he recorded it, how many people had, had heard this? Was this a story that, that kind of disseminated quickly and a lot of people heard about it right away? Or was this one, one of those accounts that it wasn't until Matthew wrote it down that, that people are reading it for the first time? We're never going to have the answer to that, that question. And perhaps it's not really that important. But you wonder what people's reactions were when they heard this the first time. Maybe if they're, they're reading Matthew's account of the gospel for the first time and they're hearing that these magi traveled from the, this faraway country in the east to, to come and see Jesus, that they were uh, numbered among some of the first people to, to see this Messiah, I'm willing to bet that they were a little shocked. They were a little shocked because they knew who the magi were. They knew what kind of guys were, were a part of this group they'd call the, the magi. You see, the, the Magi were, were, were people that served in the royal courts in Babylon and in Persia, in, in these faraway nations. They were sort of advisors to the, the king, uh, but they were heavily involved in, in occultic practices. They, they, they trusted heavily in, in things like astrology. Um, they, they believed in foreign gods, many of them uh, did. And so if you were a first century Jewish Christian that's reading Matthew's gospel as he penned it for the first time, you're shocked. You're shocked that people like that were, were some of the first people to come and, and worship this Savior. That these foreigners, these Gentiles, these non-Jews traveled this great distance to worship this Jewish Messiah. Should they have been surprised? I suppose we could probably ask ourselves the same question, maybe not about the, the Magi, but about maybe a similar uh, circumstance. When you hear that the, the gospel is being spread and believed in large numbers in, in places where the gospel traditionally has not been taught, in, in places that are traditionally a different religion, like a traditionally Islamic place, if people are, are hearing the gospel and believing it in a place like, like Pakistan, are you surprised? Or if you're hearing that people are believing in Jesus and being baptized in mass numbers in communist China, are you surprised? And if you are, you have to ask yourself this question, why? Why are you surprised? Is it because the gospel only works on people like us? Or it works better on people like us? Is it because somehow the, the, these people in these countries are harder to convert than we are? Because let me tell you, we weren't that easy to convert either. It wasn't like we were just barely on the brink of destruction. It wasn't like we just barely needed saving. The Apostle Paul says, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. Dead. A dead person can't do anything. We were by very nature objects of God's wrath. It was going to take more than a band-aid to save us, more than CPR to resuscitate this spiritually dead, lifeless body that was headed for destruction and, and hell. That's the message of Epiphany. Good news, right? No, it, it is good news. It is good news. Because Epiphany is where we celebrate and remind ourselves, because we need to be reminded that Jesus came to save all people that all people need the word of God, that all people need the law, all people need the gospel, and that all people, regardless of their backgrounds, their physical differences, their ethnicities, 
are all equal under God's law and under his gospel. We've already kind of talked about that a bit, but let me explain a little bit more what I mean. Without Jesus, we all stand convicted by God's law. Without Jesus, we all stand condemned by God's law. We have that in in common. Without Jesus, if you're white, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. Without Jesus, if you're black, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. Without Jesus, if you're Asian, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. The same spiritual realities exist for all people. The same spiritual need exists for all people. And Jesus came to to fill that need. In fact, he wanted to save all people so badly that he moved heaven and earth to do it. He he literally moved from heaven to earth (laughs) to do it. Conceived in a miraculous way, born in a shockingly normal, humble way. He humbled himself, condescended for 33 years to, be, to, to come to our level so one day we would ascend to his. He took the punishment for the sins of the whole world, put it on his shoulders, and put it to death on the cross. He made sure that, that we wouldn't be locked in the grave forever, but that we would have life. He was raised to life for all people. Jesus came to save all. He moved heaven and earth to do it. And you can see that he moves people to do it too. That's what what happens in the story of the the Magi this morning. We said already that they came from somewhere in the east, somewhere in in Babylon, what would be modern day, like Iraq or Iran, uh, when what was formerly Persia. They traveled this great distance to see this Savior Yet, have you ever asked yourself the question, how did they know to come? And sure, you could say, well, well they saw the star, but they, they knew who they were looking for. They knew they were looking for a king. They just didn't know where this king exactly was. They knew they were looking for a king, and how, how do you know? They're bringing gifts fit for a king. How, how did they know that? Well, the answer to that question might just lie 600 years before that. God had carried out an awful punishment on the the Jewish people. The Jewish people had fallen away from him, had been unfaithful, had been uh, stubborn in their unbelief. And so God sent this punishment on the the people. And he sent the Babylonians to come and destroy Jerusalem, to burn the temple, and to to take the, the Jewish people into exile. It was a terrible punishment, but it put a guy like the prophet Daniel as one of the, the Magi. He was among the company of the Magi. Could it be that, that through this, this terrible punishment that God, God brought on his people, could it be that God moved the Israelites to Babylon to plant the seed of the gospel, to plant the promise of the Messiah who would come for all people in Babylon? <laughs> Maybe God moved people God moved people to save them. God moved the the Magi so that they would see the Savior. They they traveled a great distance, and they did so because they saw a star. He he used perhaps their sinful trust in astrology to move them from where they were to to Jerusalem, to to the presence of evil King Herod. And and he used evil King Herod and and his his ill-intentioned use of the Old Testament prophecies to direct the the Magi to to Bethlehem. Also that these Magi, these foreigners, could see their Savior so they they could worship Him, so that they could be saved. Praise God for that. That God isn't just the God of the Jews. Because if He was just the God of the Jews, then He wouldn't be most of our God. If he, was just, if he had just sent his son to save the Jews, Jesus would have just come for, for some people and, and not for most of us. Yet because God is the God of all and because Jesus is the Savior of all and so deeply wants to save all people, he came for you. He came for me. He came for all people. Just as the law equally convicts, just as the law puts us under that, that condemnation, so also the, the gospel 
is for all people. The gospel lifts everyone up out of that condemnation. He says in, in, Paul says in Romans, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no other qualifiers there. If you're in Christ Jesus, you, you have no condemnation. You've been lifted from that. that. That salvation, that forgiveness, and that love of God is yours through Jesus. No other qualifiers there. He gives that to you freely. And it is through the preaching of this gospel that you are brought into the family of believers. As Paul says, you become heirs, heirs of eternal life. You've been, become family members of God. Here's what he says in a different place in, in Galatians chapter 2. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. What Paul is saying is not that we need to pretend that our our physical differences don't exist, but what he's saying is they have no bearing on your your spiritual reality. That Jesus came to die for for all people, and regardless of your, your age your race, your gender, that forgiveness that Jesus won is for you. He died for all and he was raised for all. (laughs) And so we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised when we hear that the gospel is working in a place other than here. (laughs) We shouldn't be surprised when the gospel is working here. And we shouldn't hesitate to open up the boundless riches of God's grace to anyone and everyone that will listen. Because God's willing to move heaven and earth and people just to save. He was willing to do that for you, too. Think about all the things that had to go just right for you to be sitting here today. For some of you, maybe it was the family you were born into, the parents who brought you to the baptismal font before you could even even walk. Give thanks to God for them. Maybe for you, it was that that friend, that courageous friend that God put in your life at just the right time, that was courageous enough to invite you to come and hear of the boundless riches of God's grace. Give thanks to God for for them. Maybe it was the the persistent family member that was really annoying at first because they they wouldn't stop witnessing to you about Jesus. No matter how many times you brushed off that Jesus stuff, they just kept encouraging you. They kept inviting you. They kept talking to you. And you're thankful they did, because you wouldn't be here if it weren't for, for them. Give thanks to God for them. Think about all the, the, the good times that God has allowed you to experience and the tough times that God has allowed you to experience to bring you here. And think about how many times God has reached out with his word and with his sacraments to bring you here and to make sure that you stay here. He moves heaven and earth and people to save. And he did that for, for you. There's one more instance where he moves people for his good purposes here, and it's at the end. After the, the, the wise men have given their, their gifts to the, um, to, to the baby Jesus here, they, they go back a different way. They were going to go back to Herod, right? But they didn't know Herod's motives. God did. And so God intervened in a real way, sending them a dream and telling them to go back a different way. And so in this way, God spared his son Jesus uh, from, from dying at that time so that he could die later. And he, he saved the, the Magi. Who knows what would have happened to the Magi? If, if you learn a little bit about Herod, he's a crazy guy. He, who's, who knows what would have happened to the Magi if they went back to Herod. But God spared the Magi too and sent them back to their country armed with the gospel. Uh, how many more people would come to hear about this Messiah because the Magi had gone to visit and now brought that gospel back to their country. How many people around you will, will learn of Jesus' forgiveness and of his love because you reflect that love that God has for all people in how you live and how you act? How many more people will be encouraged to come back to this place to hear about the boundless riches of, of Christ because despite any physical differences, you, you showed them that, you, that they're welcome here? And that God's grace is for them. I bet you a lot of people will. I bet you a lot of people will because if I know anything about our God, 
is that he, he moves heaven and earth and people, even us, to save. Amen. Hi there, Pastor Wilkie here. Thanks for listening to this week's sermon. If you liked this sermon and liked the content that we're producing as a church, could you do us a favor? Could you hit subscribe on whatever platform you are listening to this on? That helps us be, be heard by more people more often so that more people might hear about Jesus and his love. Take care, have a great week, and we'll see, we'll see you next week for another sermon.